Hallelujah. How y'all doing this morning? Well, last time I was up here, uh, we we're teaching on the glory of God and the fire of God, which was a great message. Leviticus 9 was just like right on. Leviticus, you know, has some pretty intense uh, chapters. And I was like, yes, we can just talk about the glory of God. Chapter 9, that was a wonderful time. So I said, what is coming up next that I got to teach? And I looked at chapter 11, I was like, oh my goodness, let's talk about eating. Whoa, that's really spiritual. <laughs> that's really deep. I was like, no way, from the glory of God to what we eat. So I entitled this message, To Eat or Not to Eat? That is the question. And in thinking about this message, I said, you know what, I could do a demonstration. I could put out a bunch of different foods and choose which ones would I eat or not to eat. You know, I could choose like uh, something that I eat that's a little unusual to some of you might be. I like to put peanut butter on cheese. And I'd see how many of you guys, but I said, you know what? Come to my mind was a little video clip. Matt, do you have it? From the show Survivor of when these guys were eating some pretty crazy stuff because Leviticus 11 is some pretty crazy stuff in it. So first of all, they were eating worms, like really big, yucky worms. Secondly, they were eating cow brain, I believe. Now you're going to see the last one. There's only two people remaining. And again, the, why would you eat something like this? Well, the winner of the show gets a million dollars. So what would you eat for a million dollars? Well, let's show, show a little video clip just to whet our appetite today. You find yourself in a food challenge, hearkening back to the very first season in which the one food item you couldn't get down was a grub. Now here you are 13 years later in the final. What do you think that last food item know. is? Oh, Pull God. it open, <laughs> reveal. <laughs> grubs. I can't do that. You each have two grubs. Oh. They weigh the same oh. in combined oh. weight. All you have to do is get them down. There is nowhere to hide. Only one person it, moves Jared. on. Jared, Two grubs. On. This is season one, man. I can't, this, I, you know I can't do this. You gotta go for it. You gotta. All right, here we go. This is it for immunity. Oh. Survivor's ready. Go. Oh. Come on, Jervis. That a boy. Yeah. Come on, Jervis. Come on, Jervis. Change history right yeah. here. Get it, Jervis. Fight through it, Culpepper. You're almost done. Keep it down. You're good. Monica has the first one down. Monica working on her second. Jervis put both of them in at once. Jervis, you got it. Two different stories. For Jervis, a shot at redemption. For Monica, it would be her first individual immunity. Monica has it. All right, that's good. <laughs> So if you came this morning hungry, you can't wait to get home and eat, well, I just killed that. <laughs> so might as well stick around for a little bit. <laughs> so anyway, if you look and really read, we're not going to go all in depth into Leviticus 11. We're not going to read every verse because there's a lot of them. But you'd be like, really? Who would actually eat those things? Most of us like, come on, God. Would people actually eat that? Well, if you live in society, now we're, we live in a pretty privileged society. Aren't we blessed by God? But there are places in this world where you don't know what you're going to eat each day, and so you're going to eat whatever you can. So uh, let's, before we get more into chapter 11, let's just review where, what we've covered so far. The first seven chapters of Le Leviticus deal with sacrifices. They reveal to us symbolically the new covenant meaning of being a what? Living sacrifice. The revelation of the five different Old Testament sacrifices help in the daily examining of our hearts. So that's what it revealed to us in those first five chapters or seven chapters was, you know, those different sacrifices help us examine our hearts. In chapter 8 through 10, it dealt with the priestly responsibilities. But since 1 Peter 2.9 declares us all to be God's holy priesthood, we all understand our individual roles and how to prepare the atmosphere for the glory of God to manifest and the fire of God to fall. You know, one key thing regarding that, that was just as I was worshiping the Lord, 
You know, I could easily just go through the motions and just sing the songs, but I said, Lord, let me not just go through the motions. Let me not just sing these songs. Let me just completely be consumed by you. And that should be our goal every single day. The moment we wake up, the first thing we should do is, Lord, free me of every distracting thought. Free me of everything, Lord God, that's that I'm going to be, you know, a lot of us, why we're going through the trials we're going through? You want to get past the trial you're going through? You want to get through the tests and pass it and get on the other side? The reason we're going through what we're going through is to come to an end to ourselves. That's what God's looking for. He wants a people that have come to an end of themselves so what? Then they can be filled with him, consume with him, filled with his glory. What is the world needing? They're needing the glory of God. Whether it be President Hillary, Hillary Clinton or President Donald Trump, they're not going to be able to give what only God can. What the world is really needful of is the glory of God. We are the temple of his glory. So we learned that in uh, for, uh, chapter 8 through 10. And now as we go into chapters 11 through 17, we're going to deal with holiness. What it looks like to be holy in our everyday life. The purity chapters. So first of all, we got a warning up. Warning, warning. As we're going into holiness, what can often come? Legalism. So important thing to understand in order to avoid legalism is that in the Old Testament, Jews were set apart from the world by their outward works. In the New Testament, we have the Holy Spirit within. So we are now set apart by the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is the character of God, and by the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in power through his gifts. So we're not set apart by our outward works. We're set upon by our inward character and our outward power by God. If someone tries to force outward change without inward transformation, anybody ever experienced that before in church where you were kind of forced to change by people? Maybe even by your parents growing up where you weren't really, have, you had not yet accepted Jesus in your heart. You weren't really walking with God, but you were forced to try to be a Christian. It doesn't work too well, does it? Your heart has to change first. So if someone tries to force outward change without inward transformation, then religious legalism forms, and they're now more bound in religion than they were in sin. And some people who are bound in religion have a harder time getting free than those who are in sin. Usually those in sin realize they're wrong and realize how much they need help. Those bound in religion think they're okay. Matthew 23, 15 says, What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? I love this scripture. Hypocrites! For you cross land and sea to make one convert, and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell you yourselves are. That just hits it hard. Jesus hit it hard. He had no problem with saying the truth straight up. We can't be afraid to offend people with the truth. Amen? The truth does what? It sets people free. Those who are open. Those who are not, yeah, we might get some persecution, but those who are open will be set free. So the question comes down to, as we're going to go into Leviticus 11, does what we eat really matter? Now we're talking about holy lifestyle. Why are we talking about eating? Well, eating is a big part of our life, isn't it? We spend usually three meals a day, which consumes a lot of our time, eating food. Now, some of us eat food. We all eat food to, to live because you can't live without food. But also, we eat food to build relationships. It's usually how we fellowship. Food is usually involved, especially in church gatherings. You can hardly have a church special event without food involved. People expect food at any gathering, and that's why it's hard for us preachers not to get fat, unlike Pastor Steve, who's chosen to be the vegetarian, so he only picks and chooses. Now, look at this little joke, because I thought, talking about eating, we need to get some jokes, and I'm not the best joke type of guy. When I get people to laugh, usually accidentally, I don't think of a joke, but I decided to look up a few jokes, so here we go. About to eat my vegan, gluten-free, soy-free, antibiotics-free, raw, non-GMO, organic, fat-free, low-carb dinner. Plus, B12. 
Because my wife would love this. My wife actually loves to eat ice. She just takes bags of ice and just eats it all the time. Well, also, if you're important about your health, you don't want just any ice. It better be filtered right, right? (laughs) So that might be your dinner if you really want to leave healthy is just a bunch of ice. Now, how about this one? Eating right? A man visits his doctor with celery stalks in each ear and a carrot stick up each nostril. He mumbles, Doc, I'm just not feeling well. The doctor replies, maybe you're not eating right. Get it? Uh, Okay, all right. I'm not the best of jokes, but there you go. Try to lighten things up before we talk about food. So what does the Old Testament say about food? 11.1 says, Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. Of all the land animals, these are the ones you may use for food. So God is saying in the Old Testament, this is what you can eat. Now we're going to skip through many of those verses, because as we're going to find out in the New Testament, a lot of those verses, it really just doesn't matter no more. But, verse 46, what were in those verses? Here's a little summary. These are the instructions regarding land animals, birds, marine creatures, and animals that scurry along the ground. They even included insects. By these instructions, you will know what is unclean and clean, and which animals may be eaten and which may not be eaten. So why did God have a list of what to eat or not to eat? Well, Leviticus Leviticus 11 describes in depth what to eat or not to eat regarding these things. The Jews who had left Egypt where they ate whatever they wanted were now being commanded by God to distinguish between clean and unclean animals, and this is why. Number one, preservation of meat in those days was limited. There was no refrigeration. Best you could do was put some salt on some stuff, preservative. Preserve for a little bit. How long could meat go? Not very long. That's why God fed the children of Israel every day. He would give them manna. And then when they got tired of manna and demanded meat, he would give them meat every day. Until they got so sick of it that they couldn't handle it anymore. Can't have, health-wise, you know you cannot only eat so much meat. It's not healthy to eat too much of anything, actually. God wants his children to avoid the sicknesses and diseases that fall to those who cannot control what they eat. He wants us to live long, healthy lives. So that was number one, why he had what to eat and what not to eat. Number two, the clean animals were largely herbivores, while the, while the unclean were carnivores or scavengers. Scavengers are filled with what? Contaminants. Lobster, crab, bottom fish stuff, pigs. What do pigs eat? Garbage. So when you eat these things, you're putting garbage inside. So, of course, one is much healthier than the other. Also, God forbade the eating of fat and blood. We know the fat in meat is unhealthy. The leaner the meat, the better. Yet the reason for this in the Old Testament is much more of a spiritual thing. As the blood is connected to the soul. And they were not to consume the soul of a creature. So that was one of the big reasons. So, what does the New Testament say? Do we have to still abide by those rules, those laws today? Well, let's find out what the New Testament says. Mark 7, 17 says, Then Jesus went into a house to get away from the crowd, and the disciples asked him what he meant by the parable he had just used. Don't you understand either, he asked? Can't you see that food you put into your body cannot defile you? There's the answer. Food doesn't go into your heart but only passes the stomach and then goes into the sewer. By saying this, he declared that every kind of food is acceptable in God's eyes. And then he added, it is what comes from inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these vile things come from within. They are what defile you. It's amazing how legalist people can get so into stuff that really doesn't matter and not focus on the things that really do. So somebody will make such a big deal about going to church on Saturday instead of Sunday. 
such a big deal about what to eat or not to eat, and all these different issues, but if you have a relationship with these individuals, you'll find that their character is really ugly. Those different things I just said is part of their life. So God, of course, cares much more about our heart than what we eat. That is what he's after. He wants a clean heart. It's what comes. How do we know the condition of our heart? Well, out of the abundance of the, the mouth. So we just have to listen to what comes out of our mouth on a regular day basis. Maybe when we come to church, we speak pretty nice and spiritual. But what about throughout the week? How about when we're tested on our job? How about when we're interacting with our family members? Out of the abundance of a heart, the mouth speaketh. So God is much more concerned about what is coming out of our mouth than what we're putting in our mouth. All right, we got that. So he's after a pure heart. A pure heart is what God's after. That is what matters. Let's go into more depth on this eating subject. We basically got the answer, but... God wants to take this understanding of clean and unclean animals to a deeper level in the New Testament. What we see, see people are like, you know, the Old Testament's so legalistic. Well, the New Testament, people will see it's just cheap grace. Well, not really. The New Testament, the standard is much higher. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit within. So let's look at a higher standard from understanding of this clean and unclean animals. Acts 10.9 says, The next day as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon, and he was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the sky open, and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat them. No, Lord, Peter declared, I have never eaten. How many of us have ever said that? No, Lord. (laughs) We might not have said that out of our mouth, but we've said it with our actions. Peter was saying it straight up to the Lord's, (laughs) straight up face to face, no, Lord. That's how bad tradition can get, legalism. That's how we can become, where we don't even see the truth. We don't even hear the truth. We're just like, no. I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. But the voice spoke again, do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. And then later on in Acts, it reveals more of the heart behind the message of what God was revealing to Peter. Peter told them, you know it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. So I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. Now, Now tell me why you sent for me. Then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. In James 2, 1, it says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. So we see the heart of the matter here. Forget about food. Focus on the heart. How is our heart towards other people? That's a big part. You know, how can we say we love God and we cannot love one another? What is the condition of our heart compared to love? How do we think of other people? How do we treat other people? How do we treat people from other backgrounds, from other races? You know, we think we've come a long ways in this nation since the 60s and before that. But honestly, as I've been looking at things and finding out history, we haven't advanced much from slavery. Check history. Look at where we're at truly. The prison systems have more African-American men than there were in slavery. The system is completely rigged. There's a lot of deception when we hear law and order. And there's a lot of unfair treatment and a lot of individuals doing the same crime. One race gets more in jail than the other. When we look at jobs, men and women have 
equal now education opportunities, but still men and women get f treated unfairly regarding how much they get paid on their jobs. By a much higher amount, men get paid higher than women for the same position and the same educational level. So regarding our society, we may have advanced a little, but we have a long ways to go. And regarding the church, Sunday morning is the most segregated day of the year. Now, we have a church that's not like that. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But just because we gather together does not mean we are like this. To get like this means relationship. Means though you're different, and though I might not understand your background and your culture, because we are brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, I will put off my cultural differences and I will embrace you. I will learn about you. I'll, I'll, I'll learn to celebrate your differences. That is what God is looking for. God is looking for a people that have no favorites, no partiality. See, the lower nature of mankind is full of ignorance. And in ignorance, we make a big deal out of nothing, skin color. Skin color scientifically means basically nothing. We all have the same color of blood within us. And we're all covered by the blood of Jesus. And therefore, if we're truly spiritual beings, we're no longer ignorant and we're no longer divided between races and cultures and male and female and different things. When we're truly spiritual beings, we've come out of our lower nature and we've come up to a higher standard and we no longer are, by how we were raised, by our experiences, maybe while we were young, we had an experience with somebody from a different race in a negative way, so now we have branded everybody in that race in a bad way. But because we are saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit, we put off those things and we've been changed and transformed from God. And now we see people through the blood of Jesus. Amen? Now with that being said, does it matter what we eat? Well, let's continue. <laughs> Don't listen to anyone that says differently what to eat or not to eat. Because there's still a lot of people that teach these legalistic issues. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5 said, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and com commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. If it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Now, Pastor Steve is a vegetarian. Has he told any of you in order to be right with God, you have to be a vegetarian? No. So Pastor Steve's not a false teacher. It's a choice. You feel like it's the healthy thing to do? Then do it. If you don't, it's up to you. So anyone who tells us that eating certain things is spiritually wrong is a false teacher. Of course, it's okay to encourage people to eat their veggies for health's sake. It is smart to be cautious about what we put in our bodies. But what we eat does not determine our spiritual condition, does not defile us. God's kingdom isn't a matter of what you put in your stomach, for goodness sake. How ignorant is that? It's what God puts with your life as he sets it right, puts it together and completes it with joy. So the next picture you see there, anybody remember Weird Al Yankovic? He changed the song, Just Beat It, to Just Eat It. So basically, just eat it. Don't worry about it. Yet, there's some of us, including myself, that are very conscious of our physical condition. See, this is not a spiritual condition thing. This is a physical condition. And there are scriptures in the New Testament that talk about our physical state of being. 
Do you not know that your body is a temple of what? The Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You're not your own, for you are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. It doesn't bring glory to God if our body is not looking our best. You know what I'm saying? So we should treat the body that he gave us, the temple, just like with every possession we have, everything we have, we should, treat, we should um, honor God with it, including our bodies, most importantly. And it says, so whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. See, how does physical food and, and spiritual go together? Well, if, we're not, if our heart has issues, if we have insecurities, if we have different things, then sometimes what we eat can be because of that. We could overeat, just like we could overspend on clothes. We can overdo this. We can overdo that. So these are different issues of our heart. So what we eat can be affected by the condition of our heart. And so a big part of changing our lifestyle altogether is God changing our heart. But by trying to stop those th certain things that we know are excessive in our life without God changing our heart, it's never going to turn out right. It's always going to become legalistic. It says physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better. So it's not just what we eat, but it's also how we take care of our bodies, exercising. So Nissel, you can get ready for a special as I give today's charge. So with what we learned today, what is today's charge? We have a young lady, Nissel, she's going to be doing a special. It's her first time. So I want you not to make her nervous. Block out everything and worship God. We're going to have a powerful song to end. But today's charge is this. First of all, are we treating people equally? Do we have biases? We might not think we do, but really examine your heart on that. If so, we're unclean and we need to get right with God. When we have biases, we're unclean. It's fleshly. It's of the lower nature. Like Peter, we need to be transformed to see others as God sees them. Secondly, are we following Old Testament law or New Testament grace? If we have tried to force outward change without inward transformation, then religious legalism is forming. And we're more bound in religion than we were in sin. If we are legalistic, it's time to repent and ask God to free us from the religious spirit. Thirdly, sleeping seven to eight hours a day, eating a healthy diet, Drinking plenty of water and exercising regularly are something we all need to be doing, right? It's never too late to start. God wants us to live a long life. But bless God, let's do our best and take it to heart. Be encouraged. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Don't feel condemned. Just ask God for grace. That's it. Amen. This final song. Blah.